Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jill Weidman, and on behalf of the Tutor Brady Institute, I would like to welcome you to our Hot Topic event, Internet of Things and Cyber Physical Security. Before we begin, I'd like to share a little about Tutor Brady Institute, our session partner, and our sponsor. The Tutor Brady Institute was created to promote collaboration across public and private sectors with a focus on business, culture, and diversity. We're looking to reshape and develop collaboration and partnering practices with a view to improving and securing business and economies. A core concept of the Institute is our think tank for partnership excellence. The think tank has allowed us to bring together experts and leaders from the public and private sectors and academia from around the world to reshape and develop collaboration and partnering practices while embracing the most critical technology growth. If you're not currently a member of the Institute, we invite you to visit our website to learn more and see how you can participate. I'd like to recognize our partner organization, the Association of U.S. Cyber Forces, for all their support in helping us to put together this event. The Association of U.S. Cyber Forces is a nonprofit military and veteran service organization that provides the voice for cyber professionals who serve in the military and with other national security agencies, as well as within industry, on specific cyber issues impacting national security. AUSCF is an advocate for positive change to policies and programs that better serve their membership and help minimize gaps between the private and public sector cybersecurity efforts. And a special thank you to our sponsor for this event, Gorilla Corporation. Gorilla Corporation is a leading global sales, marketing, and technology channel development company with a focus on serving the technology industry. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to the Honorable Lucian Niemeyer, our moderator for this event. Lucian is the CEO and Chairman of the Board of Building Cybersecurity, a nonprofit focused on enhancing global safety by developing frameworks with stakeholders across multiple sectors to promote cyber protections and operational technologies, controls, and devices for enhanced human security and safety in an increasingly smart world. He's also a member of the Tutor Breda Institute Board of Directors. Lucian? Jill, thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Miguel, and the rest of the TBI team. And, uh, and also the Carlo, I hope he's uh, joining us as well. Uh, I'm thrilled uh, to be able to uh, spend the next hour with you all. I know it's 7 p.m. on the East Coast. We will keep you entertained. Um, over the next hour, it'll be a fast moving discussion about the internet of things um, and where it might create uh, opportunity for us, but also challenges, particularly when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, and I am thrilled uh, to be able to be uh, joined by um, uh, some of the most amazing evangelists and experts that you could ever imagine. Uh, I'm, what I'm going to do here is I'll, I'm going to uh, uh, ask them to briefly introduce themselves uh, and then um, like to go ahead and set the stage for a follow on discussion, if that's OK with you. Uh, for the audience members, uh, we will be checking chat um, so as opposed to Q&A. So if you can locate the chat button down below, if you have a question you would like to ask the panelists, that'll be fantastic. I'll be monitoring that. I'll also be providing information about um, the uh, organization. I think our panelists will also be providing information about their organizations as well. So please open up the chat. And if you've got a question now, if you have a compelling need to ask a question uh, in, in person, um, raise your hand. Uh, I'll try to get to you. Um, Jill, if you can track that, if anybody's got their hand raised, you can unmute them. Um, but we'll also um, be able to potentially take some questions live uh, from the audience. Um, so real quick, i like to just, first of all, uh, turn it over um, to uh, uh, one of my dear friends, uh, Fred Gordy. Um, he's uh, one of the chief evangelists at a company called Intelligent Building LLC, Fred, and then Dave Fernandez uh, from um, uh, from uh, uh, CompuSec Direct, as well as um, also working with the foundation uh, to uh, bring the cyber community together. So, Fred, I'd like to turn it over to you first, uh, just to uh, explain what you've been working on, your history, and some of the key points uh, that you hope that we'll discuss today. Um, and then, Jose, I'll ask you to go next, and then we'll, we can get into a discussion from there. Um, so, Fred, the, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lucian. And uh, also, I want to thank the Institute for the opportunity to evangelize, because I am very passionate about this uh, subject. In fact, uh, to give you a quick little history about me, um, I was an IT guy up until 2000, and I had an opportunity to uh, interview with a company called Facility Robotics. And in my mind, I had one idea of what this was. But when they explained to me this building control thing, I looked at him and said, are you sure you got the right guy? 
And they said, well, absolutely, because these devices are being connected to the networks and the internet ultimately. So 22 years I've been in the controls industry. And for the past eight years, I've been focused specifically on cybersecurity for building control systems. And like Lucian said, um, you know, I got, he and I've come to know each other and I got the opportunity to participate as one of the team members on building cybersecurity.org. And we've been working for the past almost two years now, building a cybersecurity framework built off of uh, International Society Automation 62443. Jose? Hey, hi everybody. My name is Jose Fernandez. I am the president of CompSec Direct. So CompSec Direct is my company. Uh, I started this company almost nine years ago. And um, if you don't know anything about me, um, then I will just very briefly kind of like summarize my experience here in, in the field. Um, I started in cybersecurity in about 2004 when I started my first company that was dedicated to IT security back then. Um, after that time, I transitioned into the military and I became one of the first uh, computer network operators um, to, to go in and start doing and participating conducting offensive and defensive operations. Um, my company recently um, got a kind of like a, a qualification through Microsoft to do uh, firmware security evaluations. So that, that's pretty neat. So um, I'm going to share uh, the link to, to our website here. Uh, here is also my LinkedIn if you want to uh, find out a little bit more about me and potentially connect to, to do business engagement, then um, here is that information as well. Um, I am also here uh, representing the AUSCF. So I am a recruitment lead for this organization. A, um, like it was mentioned earlier, AUSCF is dedicated to improving legislation and policy that affects cybersecurity policies within the US. Um, I would highly encourage you to check out our website at AUSCF, there are a lot of things that we can fix together. And an organization like AUSCF is definitely one of the better places to try to influence and start that change. So with that, uh, I will pass it over back to you, Lucian. Yeah, appreciate that very much. And look, the goal over the next uh, hour or so, and uh, you, and we're gonna have our audience uh, task us, we gotta come, come up with five concrete takeaways. I think between the three of us, we can do that. Um, as far as either advice or things that the audience members should be taking a look at when it comes to the internet of things. So what I like to do, you know, before we get into some questions is, you know, kind of set the stage. A lot of folks have different definitions of what IT, OT is, what IOT is. So really what we're looking at is the difference between uh, information technologies, which is really centered around data and the manipulation of data, the movement of data, the accumulation of data um, and, and associated software programs. Um, when we when you start crossing in and it's actually converging into OT, those are the operational te technologies. Those are the cyber physical systems that takes a data input or a keyboard stroke and turns it into a physical action. Um, you know, the best example I can give is right now your car, if it's got about maybe 1500 microchips in it, each of them are taking uh, data and moving and translating into a physical action in your car whether it be your radio, your power seats, or your braking system or your accelerator, what we're going to discuss today is, okay, great, we're, we're adopting these Internet of Things, these connected devices that, that have cyber physical systems within them, and, and we are bringing new millions of new uh, uh, devices on every day. How can they be engineered? How can they be protected from a cyber threat? And that's really... The focus is that when you talk about the Internet of Things, is the connectedness of all the devices, whether it be in your home, whether it be in your car, whether it be in a building, which is what Fred and I have been working on. It could be in, in, any, in, in any manufacturing processes. As we want the convenience of an intelligent system, a, a smart set of controls, it offers society so much benefit um, as far as efficiency, you know, better quality of life. But, but we're also potentially creating risk in human safety and in human security. That's what we want to talk about today. And I'm, we're hoping uh, by the end that we'll give you some good advice of things to think about um, and, and uh, be able to discuss offline further. Um, like I said, we're going to be have, putting contact information for each of us uh, up front. 
but I really want to, uh, I want to talk first and Fred, I'll turn to you for the first question. You and I have been working on, okay, assessing where we have risk in current uh, 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 systems and current designs or actually in current construction. You know, wh what do you think we have to do to get in front? What we call is going to the left. Um, are, are you comfortable that we have sufficient uh, engineering and design standards, whether we're building a car, whether we're building a, a, the next um, you know, a control system, are you comfortable that we're truly engineering safety into our controls? I'll, I'll open it up to you. Sure. Uh, actually, no. Um, not, not saying that we're not making strides in that direction. Yes, we are. But you have to stop and think about what these devices how they're how they are structurally and in systems set up they're set up to be convenient they i mean like you said lucian this is a matter of convenience that's why we have all these things and so when you look at an it structure the um the, they have a triad it's called cia which is confidentiality number one integrity the data has to be good number two, and number three is availability. And you don't need, if you, you have to prove a need in order to get into something. We flip that on its head in my world, in, in cars, everything. Availability is number one. And why is that? There's two reasons. One is the devices need to talk to each other unencumbered. The other thing is the humans need to be able to interact with them fairly unencumbered. And so what's happened is over the years, for matters of convenience, these systems have been made more open, more uh, connected, and that kind of thing. Now, that's not to say that they can't be secured, but you, you really need to start there where you realize, okay, I have systems that have to be connected and they have to be unencumbered to work. We just got to figure a way to make them secure. Yeah. Jose, anything to add to that? Because I know you, with your unique background, you're coming at it from a more direction of the IT safety and security. Um, you know, anything to add to that? So absolutely. Availability is basically what rules that CIA triad. Confidentiality and integrity are kind of like good to haves, unfortunately. Um, so what we're seeing is um, that interoperability of devices and the assuredness um, it might be there, but that's kind of like a secondary kind of goal, right? Because these things absolutely need to function and they need to be able to be usable first. Um, what we're seeing is uh, as all these things are becoming interconnected, um, there are a lot of issues surrounding, uh, back to that point that you made where, where IT is kind of like more concerned about where the data lives and how it's used and processed. Um, with all these different vendors that are out there, uh, that's becoming a lot more difficult to kind of manage and, and control. We can't really understand how we incorporate these simple to use devices into our life. And we, we don't really understand how that information is being shared and disseminated across the different partners that support those ecosystem of IoT devices. Yeah, and, and, and it's funny because I'm not sure a lot of folks realize the risk uh, that we have uh, or we are potentially creating for everyone. Uh, uh, not Fred, not to put you on the spot, because I think I can give some examples only. Uh, but you and I have seen some pretty compelling cases. I know with my background as an assistant secretary of defense, you know, when I was working with the National Security Agency, I was pretty much scared out of sleep for about five years about what a cyber attacker, and we're not necessarily talking to nation state in some cases. I'm more worried about the cyber criminal or the cyber hacker or the cyber terrorist. Uh, that with one keystroke can create immense damage, uh, whether it be to our grid or to, our, to a water system or to a pipeline. I mean, I know you've got case studies that, that you, you, you've been working on uh, with your company. Um, anything that you think you can share about the particular risk? I know you and I, we've been focusing a lot on the risk within a building. Now, give it, can you give us a couple examples of, of where you know, people need to start thinking about this is a human safety issue um, in our in our environment, and, and whether it be in a building or in a vehicle or or in our community, uh, so I was just wondering if you you know, have anything that you, you, that really um, you know kind of draws you passionately into this as a as a as a desire that we have to really get after a solution. Absolutely, and and you know to to your point earlier, these things act, interact with the physical world, and therefore the opportunity or I don't know if you'd call it opportunity. That sounds 
like a positive thing, but the opportunity is there to actually do physical harm. And for example, we had a situation where um, there was, um, they got hit with ransomware. Well, that's, I don't want to say that's simple, but I mean, you would think you'd be able to just recover from that, you know, reload your system and everything. Well, they, they actually, what happened was they did reload the system, but they had made, they had backed it up when it was infected. And so apparently the bad guys got to thinking, okay, they're not going to pay it. So we're going to show them. This is part that's really scary to me is I've often said that people that do what I do would probably turn bad. In this particular case, I believe it was somebody that really knew what they were doing because they got into the system. Thank goodness nobody was in the building that night. They got into the building. They ran up these things called drives. These are the things that make the pumps work and circulate the water through the building. And they overrode them and burned them up. They also messed up the pumps. Now, these are big pieces of hunks of metal. And they ended up damaging these big hunks of metal. As a result, uh, and they also bricked a bunch of the controllers. And what I mean by that is they're, they're no longer functional. You have to replace them. So once they saw all this damage, they also had to tear down the really big chillers to make sure, make sure everything was okay. It took them 92 days to recover from this. Um, one other very quick, simple one, and it doesn't even have to be that complex to cause a safety hazard, is uh, we had a customer that um, somebody printed, there's a bomb in the building to a printer that was exposed. Well, they had to dump the building, and there's been cases where people have gotten hurt doing that. There are a couple of cases that have uh, recently come out about a baby dying and a, a woman dying because of the ransomware, ransomware had taken over a hospital system. And they couldn't use any of the equipment. But anyway, uh, so there, there's definitely safety issues with this. Um, so don't take for granted that just because it's, you know, you don't see it doesn't mean it can't happen. Yeah, yeah, no, I, you know, I, the great case of point I think a lot of us are looking at right now is uh, the, the attack last May on the Colonial Pipeline which was intended uh, by the bad actor just to be a quick get in, get out, season IT system, which in this case was the billing system, um, get the ransom, which was paid for in a matter of hours, um, and then get out. Uh, little did they realize that that you know, billing system was tied to a series of smart meters and smart valves. Um, and, and, and because of due diligence, the CEO had to take precautions um, by shutting down the entire pipeline in order to check to make sure there was no um, nefarious activities happening um, in the OT, um, in the cyber physical system that could have created the catastrophic loss. Um, and, and, and so, yes, the, the, that's what we're seeing across the board is a growing concern that even inadvertently, uh, bad actors are potentially creating a catastrophic uh, or potentially catastrophic condition. So, Jose, I, 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 we, we had a great conversation um, pre to this, and, and both you and Fred were talking about culture. Um, that really what we need to change is we need to start looking at, at, at how we approach these situations differently and in and instilling a sense of culture. Can you uh, uh, expand upon that a little bit for the audience as far as what you think we need to be working on when it comes to culture? That is a very uh, hard thing to address. I mean, it really starts with education and it has to start in the schools. It has to start in the home and it has to start in the workplace. Um, I will I will instill into Everyone that's here that's watching this, if you want to really understand how IoT devices and these cyber physical systems are already, you know, in our day to day lives, next time you're at a stop sign, just look. Just look at the traffic, at the traffic lights. There's probably like a camera there. There might be some some sensors there. If you trace that back to the to the uh, to the utility poles you might see a box where traditionally that control system for the traffic lights, that was a manual thing that somebody would have to program. They would have to get the timing uh, just right. So that way, you know, you'd reduce the amount of traffic accidents that occurred, let's say like at an intersection. A lot of those um, things that were old have been updated by virtue of they've been made accessible through the internet, that interconnectedness is uh, is something that 
we, we got to see grow very quickly and we didn't really stop to think, uh, you know, hey, what's like the worst thing that can really happen here? Like, um, I'll go back to that movie, uh, Hackers from 1995, where they, uh, where they hijack, you know, all, all the, the traffic lights in, in New York City and then all the lights are green. So you can actually kind of do something like this in certain areas with like a strobe light, right? The ambulances had this problem of like congested, you know, intersections. So they started putting these different like sensors that whenever they 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 see the 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 flashlights, right? That strobe light that's being emitted from the ambulance. So that thing can think, oh, there's a there's an emergency, and those lights start to change. So some of these systems, they slowly started like maturing them. So imagine now if somebody like in one of these like control stations uh, was, was hijacked, right? Because they installed log me in or some other remote access mechanism from, from the IT world, but now into the OT space, right? And in this case, the cyber physical space where because we've tried to make things more accessible and usable for convenience that uh, we, we basically created these new avenues of attack that it, before it just wasn't possible because the things weren't really interconnected that way. Uh, it really starts with, with education. So I saw that, uh, you, Fred, you'd mentioned printers earlier. I saw this from Stanford and they try to like categorize like the different risks associated with different like physical systems. I was kind of surprised to see printers right down the middle, right? So the use case, you said of a bomb threat, uh, look what happened with the emergency notification system in Hawaii. There's a ICBM inbound. What do you do, right? How do, how do you do something like that? You know, it's already like, is this for real? Like, can you really do anything in a situation like that? Um, and I think uh, I just saw something today that the emergency broadcast system uh, was also like recently either hacked or breached by some. I didn't have enough time to really like go into it, but um, all, all these things are, are really out there. Like think of like medical devices, right? These medical devices that you might be able to remotely control, right? What if somebody decided to just do something bad with that? If you, if you open these things and you take them apart, um, these devices, they, they cause hun tens, tens of dollars or hundreds of dollars for like the like smaller IoT things, they didn't cost tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars because they're not gonna you know develop expensive and secure you know components for mass consumption. It just doesn't work this way. And you have the the companies, obviously, you know, they have their boards, they have their shareholders, so they're trying to drive manufacturing costs as much. To down as they can just to you know keep those revenues uh, and those margins up for these ecosystem of devices that they're pushing out. In some cases, um, in my experience, I've been able to analyze different uh, IoT devices where uh, the, the programmers put back doors in there intentionally. And in one case, I was able to trace the back door to this uh, person's computer science project because they ha happen to have it on the internet. So as I'm inspecting firmware, I'm also seeing this thing on the open internet. It's like, how, how did this make it through? We don't have, uh, one of the issues that we have is we don't have a board system. So anybody, any Yahoo can come and do this, right? Uh, I like to consider myself a more experienced Yahoo because I've been doing this for over 20 years now. But at the same time, so we don't have that bar system. So basically anybody can come in and start making all these claims and assertions. It's like, oh no, this is, this is a very secure thing. This is safe to use. Uh, look at these ring devices, right? So look how that information is being used. It is very accessible and stuff like that. But what if you happen to commit a crime? And then the police subpoena that and it's like, huh. It's like, well, wait, I was paying for internet. I was paying for electricity. Why don't I have data ownership of these things? So. A lot of these things are creating new problems that we just simply weren't prepared to experience. Yeah, no, I, I think, uh, Jose, you've just laid out. I mean, there's so much there that we need to probably dive into deeper. Um, and, and I think uh, going back to the culture question, you look, we're only going to have more devices. We're not, you know, we're not detracting. We're not taking away. In every industry, you know, we're, we're, we want to get more automated. We want to get more convenient. 
Um, we're going to be putting technologies we can't even think of uh, today in place five years from now. So, Fred, from you on the culture perspective, how how do we get in front of that? You know, how 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 what do we need to change in our culture that's going to make us uh, safer in the future? So, I like to put the analogy. Um, most people are familiar with OSHA. Uh, OSHA started many years ago. Well, I'm old enough to be had worked in the workforce before OSHA was really majorly involved, right? Well, during that time, if you were an, uh, a guy working, when I graduated from high school, let me tell you this, I, when I graduated from high school, I went to work offshore before I went to college to make some money. And if you were afraid to climb a 200-foot tower with nothing hook it, hooking on or anything like that, your coworkers would make fun of you. Fast forward to the last mechanical engineering company that I worked for, if you climbed over six feet on a ladder and didn't tie off, you got in trouble by your employ uh, fellow employees. They would turn you in. And the reason why is that whole culture shift. But there has to be a why. Why am I doing this? Why is this important? Well, in the case of OSHA, they were trying to prevent people from getting hurt. But they didn't just start with all the regulations they have right now. They had to incrementally bring those in. And so to plug buildingcybersecurity.org, that's what we're doing is we, we've got some foundation laid for that, but it's got to be incrementally digested. I do want to go back just a little bit to the culture itself. You have to understand that these guys that are running these buildings have worked basically unencumbered for 40 years. They, they've been maintaining the systems, their major job was to make sure that the tenants and the people in the building were comfortable, right? So they did whatever they, they could to make that happen. And the owners wanted them to do that because obviously the more people that come in, the more revenue that comes in. So getting back to the why is if you have a cyber physical incident and somebody gets even just slightly hurt because of it, can you imagine the headlines of what that would say is, you know, the escalator was hacked and, and stopped and people fell down and got hurt real bad. Well, who's going to show up in that building, right? So we got to work on the culture of the guys that are actually taking care of the systems, the owners that are, are responsible for the buildings and give them the why. And Building cybersecurity is is working towards uh, that as well with um, risk uh, for cyber insurance to help promote that. So, in a nutshell, that's it. So I think we've nailed our number one deliverable as far as for our audience, and that is, and I think you guys would agree, Bro T treats cybersecurity as a safety as far as a culture is concerned. It's a safety issue. And then, and then prioritize it as commensurate with other other human safety factors. Um, I think that's that's you know to me that's just common sense. We just got to be looking at a little bit more urgency. It's not just your data, but there's 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 other risks here that you've really got to take into consideration. So, question for you both, and I'll and I'll leave it. This one's kind of a free for all. How far left? I'm an architect by degree, uh, and so I'm you know I start in design. I start with a blank piece of paper. And you design something. How far to the left in the design process do you need to put cyber safety and cybersecurity in as a key performance parameter? I'll, I'll open it up with Jose first, but uh, Fred, feel free to follow. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the things that I had seen uh, drop recently was the Internet of Things Cybersecurity Improvement Act. So this was actually signed by then President Trump near the end of 2020. And basically this act instilled uh, to NIST, it's like, we need you to help start coming out with standards to, to help you know, this IoT. Um, so the link for that is here. And I actually read some of these today. Uh, let me tell you, even like the most basic one, which is actually this internal report, this NISSERT number here that I, wasn't really familiar with until today. Uh, this is something that's trying to ask the manufacturers of IoT uh, devices. It's like, you need to start considering, you know, what is it your widget is doing? How does it communicate? What is, 
like what is its purpose does it need to have um right because not all these devices need to have the highest level of security and failover they absolutely don't uh when you when you think about minimizing things like even a printer like what if you could potentially change the firmware of a device to heat the corona transfer wire to temperatures that exceed this so you would expect the device itself to have these other failover components it's like if the temperature exceeds this you know it cuts off the power simple things like that one of the effects of globalization is the uh, uh, introduction of cheap massly produced electronics that aren't really going to be, you know, let's say like underwriter labs approved, right? So we're having all these like newer electronics that are being connected in places because they're cheap and affordable, but they don't necessarily have gone through the, the best R&D process in terms of uh, safety, right? If these things communicate, uh, you would expect cybersecurity to already be there at the beginning, but that's not Usually it's unfortunate, but uh, hopefully over time, we don't have any of these incidents, these catastrophic inf incidents that we're already kind of like red teaming and preparing for. Hopefully those situations really don't happen, but uh, the truth is they probably already have. It's just, we might just not know about it because uh, mm -hmm. things like that would be underreported. Yeah, yeah, so Go ahead, Fred. Wait. I'm sorry. Real quick, uh, I agree with the statement, start as far left in the design process as possible. But I want to add to that, the, the chain of custody goes back to the, the person that owns it. And what I mean by that is, the, you know, the manufacturers can, can add hardening guidelines and do things to it. There's a guy in the middle who is the integrator. That's what I used to be, who can put them in insecurely. And then there's a the owner of the whatever it happens to be is they have a responsibility too. They need to take the time to figure out what their risk tolerances are and put some guidelines in place that then tells the integrators, I expect this level of security and buy only products that meet this criteria. So that's a great point. I'll go ahead and nail that as number three, and that is the risk owner needs to assume ultimate responsibility because you're right. You know what spec does a technology, and what we've learned in our in the non in our work in the nonprofit, what is spec does a technology goes into an integrated system of design that can create vulnerabilities, then goes into a configuration set of controls by a third entity that might create a vulnerability, and then may be commissioned with the other systems in a and it could be a car, it could be a building, it could be anything that could potentially create risk. So really, who's ultimately responsible for ensuring all that is done well is the risk owners. Is that, is that, is that kind of where you're headed with it? Yeah, I mean, to use Jose's example, talking about the cheap stuff coming in uh, from overseas and everything. Again, it's the ultimate owner's responsibility. If they're okay with that, you know, what can you do? But if they have specifications, and I'm talking about companies, not individuals, obviously, but they need to have that specification because ultimately their name is on the building, their name is on the car, so on and so forth. So they're going to be the first one in line of fire when something, uh, when lawsuits happen. Yeah, I think that, that happened with like uh, Amazon because you know a lot of these things just get white labeled and resold. Like some of the like cables and stuff that Amazon was selling, they caught fire. <laughs> immediately you know they, they got blamed right mm -hmm. they're like oh, yeah. no we don't actually make these things we just sell them so it's not our responsibility <laughs> okay. so we're already seeing a lot of cases like that and uh you know the, these these large companies they they can afford the uh they can afford the eternities to you know fight all that it's unfortunate but it's the reality so one thing you brought up uh fred and i want to uh, drive it home a little bit and you know, we were talking about risk um, and, you know, there's three things in life we do with risk and we all make personal decisions. We either assume it, uh, we uh, mitigate it, or we transfer it. Um, and, and, I, and I see a lot of uh, asset owners and it could be in any, you know, we have car insurance, we have auto insurance, we have, we have uh, home insurance um, and we can check, yeah, we've done certain things. You know, do we have a home security system? Yeah, I've got a dog. Okay, I check that block, I get $100 off. 
you know, my, my home insurance or if I'm a good driver, I get a discount on car insurance. Um, is there an opportunity here to take the work that you've done over the years and drawing attention to the OT risk and, and talk about where risk should be mitigated versus transferred to an insurer? And, and, and for those of us who are tracking that industry right now, there's a lot of volatility, particularly in the cyber insurance market, but also the property and casualty. You know, what, what's your view? I mean, I, I think I, I'm definitely in the camp of you need to do everything you can to mitigate risk. Um, but you've been in the building industry for a lot longer than I have. What, what are you seeing as far as how folks want to assume or mitigate? Well, let's start with the simple stuff, because just like the OSHA example that I gave just a minute ago, um, it, you, you have to start somewhere, right? So the first thing that these uh, system owners need to do is take stock of the, the, the systems they have or the devices they have. What is it I have and how are they set up? That's one of the things is I, I, I tell people all the time, I could walk into anywhere and write the assessment before I ever see anything because I know how these systems are set up. So the first thing is is taking a taking stock of what you have, getting a you know accurate up to date asset inventory. Then the next thing is is to see how your stuff, your devices and systems are connected because time and again we always find things that are exposed directly to the web. For example. Uh, I found some oxygen mix tanks for a plastic surgeries uh, company out in Arizona. Now, wow. what could I do with that? I could do anything I wanted to because the protocol that it was using required no username and password. So I could just go in there. But anyway, you, those things need to be off the web. So um, again, who's responsible for that? The asset owner. I mean, even though the integrator did 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 the install, most of the time, like in, or in my earlier in my career, is you would give me a set of uh, drawings, a cut sequence of operation, and tell me to put in a Johnson control system. You didn't tell me how to put it in. You just told me to put it in. So I put it in as easy as I could. And that's a really yeah. good point that we talked about the other day, Fred. Um, so these integrators, right, we're kind of depending on them to basically implement these things the way that the manufacturer of these devices intended. Um, that may not be the case. Uh, I did this uh, research on solar equipment from Solar City back in 2017. And I, I basically looked at how this, uh, you know, the equipment, the transformer to like the metering and stuff and the, you know, solar panels, right? How all this stuff communicated and turned out that the manufacturer has, it has all these security uh, features. It uses, it was Zigbee protocol. Um, it was, uh, you know, it, the components themselves are updated, but the communication was clear text. Right, because they figure, who's really going to do anything bad with this? I think you know having you know Mac validation of you know this is the packet, and here's kind of like the signature of what I expect the packet to look like. That was good enough for them. So uh, sometimes with with things like these, um, you, you would expect them to be conf configured the way the manufacturer could kind of hoped, but who who really does those evaluations? Who really checks on that? Um, to, to the OSHA point, you know, uh, we don't really have like safety inspectors for a lot of these things. We don't have a health department that just goes into like your restaurant and say, uh, is your, you know, where you're prepping food, is it clean? You know, do you have rodents? We don't have anything like that yet, but I think we might be moving towards a model like that where it's like, hey, who, who evaluated the implementation of, you know, your, your CPS? So... Yeah, hang on here real quick, real quick, uh, Fred. Yeah. Uh, I think Jose just created a whole new industry in a matter of about 30 seconds there. Yes. Um, and, and it is something that that I think we probably need to put down as number four. We do need a cyber, cyber safety profession that can go into the built environment and, and perform those similar inspections. We have a fire marshal. We have underwriters lab for electricity. Uh, we don't have anything for cyber safety. So I just uh, yeah. want to point out that that It'll was a moment lifetime. of clarity. It will happen in our lifetime, hopefully. Yeah, so that's a moment of clarity. <laughs> that, 
that becomes number four easily um, mm-hmm. as far as uh, what we need. But uh, definitely, I think the built-in barber needs a, a, a profession of cyber um, uh, safety evaluators. Go ahead, Fred. I'm sorry. Very quickly, um, when you were talking about the clear text, Jose, um, you know, I one of one of my jobs is to think evil thoughts and do good. Um, yeah. So yeah. I go into buildings trying to figure out how to kill them. Uh, I had an opportunity to work with a government agency, not in this country. Um, but anyway, I was taking a look at their systems and they were not exposed, but um, for lack of a better description, they had data leaked. Uh, let's just call it that. And um, so when I was meeting with the head of facilities, he said, well, Fred, what do you think you could do to the system? And I said, well, if I can capture the uh, the consumption of your power, which I can, or consumption of your um, your chillers, the load of people that are in there, I can figure out the best time of day to blow up the building. Jesus. Wow. And he, he said, well, how's that? And I said, all I got to do is look at the load logs and I spot the pattern. So if they're between 10 and 11 in the morning, that's when the most people are in the building. That's when I'm going to do it. Um, but to Lucian's point about, you know, the cyber s- safety, you know, we kind of do a service like that now. It's an assessment. It's It needs to be further, but most people just want to get a read on where they're at. But ultimately, yeah. what I'd like to see is back in my days when I was doing mechanical, en- uh, mechanical engineers, is once the system was installed, you had a commissioning agent come in and test and balance the system to make sure it was done to spec. We need that for cyber too. You need a building to be cyber commissioned. I'll go one step further, and this is bragging more on the nonprofit, Fred, um, and the framework you and I have developed, and you've actually done most of the work with that, um, is that it's not just a commissioning, but there has to be a certification that, that the protections, the safety protections are being maintained. This is not electricity. This is not fire. This is cyber. This is a threat that's constantly metastasizing and growing by the month. We need to have a process where there is a, a certification that, yes, I'm maintaining the firmware, up, uh, firmware updates. I'm putting the patches. I am doing the things I need to do to sustain and maintain the, that level of cyber safety over the life cycle of the asset. Um, that's why I'm thrilled you know, that we're moving away from checklists more towards a more comprehensive and dynamic assessment process. And then you know, an offer to, 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 to maintain a certain level of service and quality and, and diligence uh, through a certification process. So that, that, so you just hit upon it. It's not just commissioning. It's not just technology, but it's also ultimately, are you willing to invest in the sustainment of the protections you need for that building? And that's, that's really why, you know, I think the work we're doing is truly a solution to get after some of the problems we've been discussing on this call. And that rests solely on the shoulders of the asset owner. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the manufacturer has their part and the integrator does, but really chain of custody goes back to the asset owner. Yep. So, so from your perspective, Jose, uh, you know, I, you, you're, you're, a, you're a company owner, you've built you know, from the ground up. What, what is it that compels folks to want to engage with your company and services? I mean, do they understand the risk or, or is it something that they're, it's only, it's only for those, those few who are enlightened to understand what the growing cyber risk really is? No, I mean, we, we definitely cater to different customers. I mean, let's manage expectations here. Sometimes people know exactly what they want, but sometimes clients, you know, they, they have a general idea of what they think they need. So it's a responsibility for me as the business owner to kind of give them the best recommendation uh, based on not only my experience, but what is convenient to them, because the the sad part about all this is, I mean, all the technology and safeguards, they might be there, but sometimes the customers aren't just willing to implement them because it's an inconvenience. And so oh, I have to do this and then I have to put this other thing is, how can I remember that? Why can't it just be four characters? Why can't it just be eight? Uh, you know, um, and get situations like that. And I have to be a good steward of somebody uh, from my field, right? Even though we don't have a bar system, like I like to think that we do. And when I provide uh, recommendations or consultations, 
uh, I try to provide whatever is, is more suitable towards them because I simply know that um, if, if we tried all the things and all the security things, pe people wouldn't use the things, right? It comes down to that availability piece. It needs to be something simple to use, um, unhindered, right? In some cases, when we saw the, uh, you know, th this is a good field to, to really kind of like age a lot. If you start red teaming all the possible scenarios of bad malicious things that you could do, um, right? That That's good when you're doing that to like another company, but when you do that to like your own organization, that's a good way to lose sleep and, you know, age very, very quickly because you start thinking about, here's all these things that are just hanging on the side of a building and somebody, I don't know, with like one of these like makeshift like uh, grappling hooks that you can order for like 25 bucks, they can just throw and just pull some of these things down, right? And maybe in like 30 seconds, that networking component for, for your system that's out like on some utility road somewhere, somebody just pulls this down yanks it and maybe 10, 30 seconds, depending on how good that first throw was. And then they can start reverse engineering and looking at how you configured some of these equipment, right? So maybe on your management system, you might see like, oh, this, this link suddenly died. Hey, what's going on with that? And when you go inspect it, it's been stolen because these things are literally, you know, they're just right there. So some of these uh, crooks understand, hey, those backhauls, those access points, they cost a lot of money. You know, so if, if that physical protection piece, if it's sometimes if it's not even like tall enough, the people can just like go on the uh, on the roof of a building and just take some of these things. Right. So yeah. you have to really look at how this entire like um, how all these things are really supposed to communicate and function. And you have to consider, well, what if this doesn't work anymore? Or, you know, worst case, what if we don't have power? There's nothing scarier than being inside of, in the center of a building that just lost power without any windows because it is pitch black. And unless you're a smoker and you happen to have a lighter on you, I mean, you, you, might, be, you might be kind of traumatized depending on how long that outage happens. Because a lot of things can happen very quickly, you know, when, when you consider stuff like that, power failure, you're like, oh, it's okay. Cause you know, the light's out, you know, it's daytime. No, not when you're inside some of these buildings and some of these places. So even like things like simple things like that, that we just take for granted, they can, they can ruin a lot more than just your day. Absolutely. Uh, I don't know, Fred, if anything to add to that, um, while, you're, while you're thinking about it, I do want to make sure we're clear for the folks on the audience. Um, I'm, I'm still checking chat. Uh, and if you've got any questions you'd like to ask our panelists, uh, feel free. Uh, to pop in now, or uh, I think we've got a pretty good group. We might be able to just, uh, you know, should see a raise of hands and have someone come in live. Uh, but Fred, anything to add to that? I mean, personally, I'm an architect. I'm hoping there will be the emergency exit signs when the power goes off in a building and they stay on battery power. Um, but I do want, yeah, I do get your point there, um, you know, th that you, you, you do lose situational awareness and you do uh, your, your orientation is all disrupted when all of a sudden your environment just disappears in a matter of seconds, which you're normally used to. Right. Fred, anything to add? Uh, well, it's a little different, but it's something that I think needs to be touched on. Sure. Is um, re it's, it's all about the vendor and it's all about uh, access management and authentication. And what I mean by that is these vendors have cars, carte blanche. They can walk into the building. They can take you know, do what they want to do and they're encouraged to, or they have remote connectivity into the buildings through TeamViewer, log me in, or directly on the web. Recently, as recent as three weeks ago, a vendor employee got fired and he trashed the system of a customer to the point that he not, he, he literally wiped free servers clean and he bricked I, uh, I don't know exactly how many controllers, but there was at least 10 of them. And why did that happen? Well, first off, every, the vendor has a single username and password for all his employees. The next thing is there is no accountability of the vendor having to notify the owner that, hey, we let this guy go. They, just, they don't do it. And there's not an authorized list of people that should have access to the system instead of just everybody that happens to work for that company. 
So you just give me number five. If you guys are checking chat, you know, ask if your uh, if your company, your asset has dynamic access management for cyber physical systems. I got one even more, Fred. And and those of your clients who have had attacks, did they have a checklist of what to do in the thirty seconds after, or the minute after, and the five minutes after? How how in your and background? I'll also ask Jose. How how much are your clients uh, prepared for the moment? that attack occurs and how to respond? They're not, um, just quite frankly, uh, very, you know, they, when we sit down with them and, or we, prior to the assessment, we always request documentation and it's around processes and policy for OT, not IT. And I can only think of one or two times that we've actually gotten something. Um, so, and most, most everything that they have uh, is in somebody's head. Uh, I got to tell you a quick story. We did an assessment on a large military base and the, the guy that w- they gave us to walk around with us, he was great. He had, he knew everything. I kid you not, the next morning when we showed up, his boss called us and said, hey, so-and-so was in a car accident this morning and he, were, he's at the hospital getting checked out. Wow. And he said, but don't worry, I'm going to send you two, two guys that work under him. 80% of the things we asked them, they said, well, we'll have to ask Joe when he gets back. Yeah, that knowledge management is, you know, that really varies between, you know, some of your, your potential customers here. Uh, in my experience, um, I've had a lot of customers that do have, you know, incident response kind of like playbooks or they have disaster recovery kind of like plans. What usually happens is, as it's starting, as an incident starts, let's say like a ransomware incident, they don't really, um, they might not really identify that very quickly until let's say like users start reporting something like that. In the case of like communications failure, you know, it could be simple like an SSL certificate expired. Now, you know, the two things don't talk to each other, but sometimes those like that first hour is it's what's going to predicate success for a lot of these uh, companies because they need to be able to quickly identify exactly what's wrong. Not, not I think it's this, I think it's that, because usually you want it to be something that's very simple. It's like, oh, you know, somebody knocked this thing off the you know, power cable or something like that, or a network cable has just become loose. Those are nice problems to have, but the reality is that a lot of the customers that, that we deal with they do have an understanding. Sometimes some of the steps that they do, it's kind of like the, the older antiquated kind of things that you would do. Like for example, for like a computer security incident, uh, they would power the systems off. They were like, that's the first thing they did up. Oh. So that way, you know, we keep all the forensics in there, you know, nothing's going in and out. So now I advise, you know, customers like, you know, that, that used to be good, but you know, there's all these things that we can get out of RAM. If you power it off, it's lost. So just disconnect the network cable, segment it somehow. You know, do those things instead. Keep it powered on, as long as it doesn't, you know, communicate with other things. But uh, it, it really depends, uh, Lucian. Yeah, Fred. Anything that? Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought up the forensics piece. Uh, that's a really good point. In my world, the data for forensics is few and far between. And in order to mine it, even just get it out, you have to have specific knowledge of doing it. You can't plug it into a scene. You know, it's so, I mean, and and also too about the instant response and that kind of thing. The 92 day thing I told you about, the guy clicked a link that he thought came from his friend and it said, hey, look at these pictures. He clicked it, nothing happened. His buddy walks through and he said, hey, man, I checked that link and I didn't see the pictures. And he said, what pictures? Mm. So now check this out. So he says, let's back up the system because something may have been wrong. Well, that's a good idea. But the thing is, the system's already infected and they backed it up. So when the vendor brought in a new machine, they restored it. They thought good. They come in the next morning, the whole building's hot because somebody got in and tore up everything. Yeah, you know, I'm, I, I'm just smiling when you mentioned about shutting the system down. That's obviously how I've been responding every time I get a green screen from a Nigerian cafe. You know, you go ahead and you unplug your PC and you're hoping you save prayer, <laughs> you plug it back in, hopefully it's gone away. 
Uh, but you're right. Uh, we're more sophisticated times. Um, that calls for more sophisticated action than saying a prayer and hoping that uh, it has gone away when you plug it back in. Um, I, I want to talk real quick. Yeah, I know, Fred, you have a point. So I'll, 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 let me go ahead and let you raise the point first. And then and I want to ask one final question. And hopefully, if we got any audience questions coming in, we can finish out with that. But go ahead, Fred. Very quickly. You you know, talking about turning the computer off and, and disconnecting everything. You got to remember, some of these systems are support some very critical things so just flipping a switch off is not an option it's a really? living thing you ha you have to keep it running you can disconnect it from the world but you can't just turn them off yeah particularly when you're talking critical safety systems or or building system okay softball question for you fred you ready um, okay what does the world need as far as getting a you know, as far as instructions about how, you know well, as far as what needs to be done comprehensively, we've, we've given, by the way, you, everybody on the audience, you've gotten a bonus uh, point here. We're up to six key points. But what really do we need moving forward um, um, to uh, to really uh, provide a comprehensive safety framework? In place? Well, the, I kind of touched on a little bit of it, but um, there's some key takeaways that I like to leave people with because, again, we can't eat the whole elephant. So the first thing I do is to look at my vendors and ask them, how do you access my system? I know that sounds simple, but if they tell you, um, log me in, team view, or that kind of thing, if they don't say anything other than we use your solution, then you, you need to do something about that because that, that endangered. And that's what happened to Oldsmar, Florida, team viewer. They came in and started monkeying with the water. The other thing is knowing what you have because rarely does anybody have an up-to-date inventory of the systems. Another quick point, in Australia, I did a, uh, a review of a network, and the guy told me, he said, well, there's only four things connected. When I scanned it, there were 32 things connected, and one of them was a Raspberry Pi that nobody knew anything about, and they took them two weeks to find it. So as an asset owner, those are the two two main things to just go ahead and try to get that taken care of. And we're not talking about spending, yes, time is money, but we're not talking about buying a bunch of stuff. You can, you can assess where you are. Yeah. Okay. Jose, bring us home. What, what, what are the things you think we need uh, as a society moving forward? Oh boy. So when I saw this NIST thing for IOT devices in federal space, that is a good start. Unfortunately, you know, standards aren't laws, they aren't regulations. That's what we really need to start gravitating towards. Um, it's really unfortunate because every time, you know, government gets involved in regulations, people complain it's gonna stifle innovation and stuff like this. But my thing has always been a lot of these things, they just kind of do the same things, right? So you can basically have a very common backend framework and a very common UI framework that's already been vetted by all these people. And you can basically keep reselling that thing almost indefinitely. And when it does need to get changed because there are defects or vulnerabilities in the software, at least, you know, having a common kind of like framework like that for how all these things should operate, uh, I think that's going to be something that uh, maybe some some VC funded kind of like thing could happen to, to grow that idea. But if basically like a lot of these like Siemens things, like they have like hard coded credentials that you just can't change. Right. So I always tell people, you know, change passwords. It's easy stuff. Uh, basically, you know, default credentials are terrible. But, you know, some of these things they got purchased 15 years ago those credentials are there and our adversaries know what those credentials are because they have those same things too. So it kind of becomes that situation of, well, when it comes to nations, they don't really want to blow each other up because they basically have some similar vulnerabilities, even though the, maybe the vendors are slightly different. Um, every time I've done like uh, pen tests, um, I always find some OT kind of like SCADA thing in the terms of like the, either the power distribution units or the OPSs. They, they connect these things, they don't change the credentials on them. And a few weeks ago, I basically con convinced the, the person who was on site, I want you to connect a lamp to this PDU. 
And I'm going to turn that socket off remotely because I can go into the management interface for this PDU. And even though you have all this security and all this cool stuff, I can just power all of that off. What do you do, right? So we were able to demo that and I actually recorded it where, you know, here's the, the light and then the light goes off as I, you know, click the, hey, power this socket off. So we have things like that and we just kind of make that assumption, oh, you know, nobody's ever gonna find these things until people like me get, you know, hired to go in and, you know, figure out what's there. So definitely having that, uh, that inventory of assets, what's actually connected, what's sending data out is crucial. All right, Fred, anything to add there? No, I think he, he covered it well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I am think we're coming up on the end here. Um, I just want, uh, I'll give, um, I have one thing I want to add, but I want to give one more opportunity for a quick lightning round. Uh, Fred, you know, what do we want to leave the audience with coming off this call right now? Take a look at how your people view the uh, cybersecurity for your things, not your IT, but your things, because you'll find you'll you'll see it's really different. How about uh, Jose? They don't get it. <laughs> and when, I, and when they pretty... say it, I mean IT. They don't get it. Even the IT people, they're like, you know, basically they they're so saturated with all this other crap that sometimes they just stop caring. And that's very challenging because it goes into that culture piece. Some people, are, they just get burned out and they're like, I don't want to deal with this. Ugh. It needs to be. All right. Yeah. So, so I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I will see your cyber assessor, like a fire marshal, a cyber marshal, and I'll raise you that for, for new designs and any part of a built environment, we need a technologist of record that has a professional responsibility for the safety and the, and, the, and the design of integration of systems that are both IT and OT. So it, because the mechanical engineer cannot do it, the electrical engineer can't do it, we need a technologist of record. I believe that's absolutely essential because that would feed into what you just suggested, Jose, which is somebody who can assess the, that, those are, that the systems that were designed continue to operate well. But it starts with a technologist of record equal to an architect of record or a civil record that has professional response, licensing responsibilities for ensuring safe design of, of, of all the systems in a building. So I'll leave it there. Um, I, I really do appreciate you guys. It's been a fantastic hour. Um, I'm sorry we went a little, uh, I think we went a little bit over, but, um, but I just wanna say thank you, Fred. Thank you, Jose. More importantly, thank you, TBI, for the opportunity to discuss the Internet of Things. I'm not sure if I'm...